It's the end of January, unseasonably warm temperatures aside, spring is not in the air, baseball season is still weeks and weeks away, and yet I am happy. And you know why. If you're watching this video, it's because it's low effort content time. That's right. It's time not just for a Not Actually Trek Actually video, but a Not Actually Trek Actually comment response video where you, my wonderful viewers who have left comments on my stuff over the past few months, have already done most of the work for me. And all I have to do is read some of your comments and then react to them. This is my job. This first batch of comments is from my most recent Trek Actually video, the one about the greatest BFFs in the Star Trek franchise, and the first of those comments comes from Andrew, who says, I'm quite excited to watch a Steve video about friendship and wholesome relationships in general. It'd be impossible for even Mr. Shives to find a reason to take any jabs or cheap shots at Picard and Lower Decks. Now, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna hold my breath. Never change, Steve, you wonderful, magnificently cranky bastard. You know, I don't know what you Lower Decks fans want from me, because not only did I include Lower Decks in my examination of BFFs throughout Star Trek, and not only did I pay particular attention to Rutherford and Tendi, but I even gave them the, the final line, the last joke, the punchline of the entire video pivots off of Rutherford and Tendi. Like, what, what, what? What more do you people want from me? What do you want from me? You want me to lie and say it's a funny show? I will not. Here's one from Grognard Piper, Picard and Guinan. Did you see that, Andrew? I spent so much time talking about Rutherford and Tendi on your precious lower decks that I didn't even have time in the video to talk about Picard and Guinan. In fact, I actually left out a few um, relationships, BFF relationships from throughout Star Trek that I probably should have at least given a mention to that either I, you know, let, let me just, uh, you know what? I'm not going to try to make excuses. I'm not going to put a, a, a positive face on it. I forgot. Okay. I was writing the video. I had a lot of BFFs on my list. I forgot. I forgot about Picard and Guinan, and that's on me, but thank you to Grognard and to everybody else, because uh, uh, several people left comments saying, well, what about Picard and Guinan? They should have been talked about. Yes, they should have. You're right. Um, I do stand behind what I say in the video, that Dr. Crusher is Picard's closest friend on board, but he and Guinan have this real, have this special closeness, this sort of transcendent, you know, as Guinan herself says in one episode um, in... Uh, in Best of Both Worlds after Picard has been assimilated when she's talking to Riker. And she says, um, what Captain Picard and I have goes beyond friendship and beyond family. They have like a, a bond that eventually is revealed, like trans uh, transcends time and space. So yeah, I think that qualifies as BFF material. So I absolutely should have mentioned Picard and Guinan. I still think Data and Geordi are the uh, definitive... BFFs of TNG, and I do think that uh, Picard's friendship with Crusher is more important to the show, but I should have at least mentioned Picard and Guinan. Absolutely. Totally right. Thank you for catching me on that. I appreciate it. Here's another one from Louis Webb 560 Another duo I was surprised you didn't mention was The Doctor and Seven of Nine from Voyager. While their pairing isn't forced down our throats as much as Tom and Harry's, it feels a lot more real and heartfelt to me, growing from a mentorship to a true friendship by the end of the series. Yeah, and once again, just something that slipped my mind, I could have mentioned uh, The Doctor and, and Seven as well. I think they qualify as, uh, as BFFs. They certainly develop a closeness by the end of the series. And not only that, but they are... I guess you could say arguably, although to me there's not really an argument against it, they are arguably the two most interesting characters on the show. And uh, the, the two characters, of all the characters on the show, the two that um, that are written the best, that, that are given the most long-term character development, long-term meaningful character development... Um, and yeah, and the Doctor and Seven are, are an interesting pair. There, there's a... There's a a depth to them because there's there's this suggestion of some unrequited love on the doctor's part 
There's the, the mentorship thing that you mentioned, and there's also the, the capacity for them to have fun as well. They can be a really fun pairing, depending on what approach the story takes. So yes, The Doctor and Seven, absolutely worthy of an acknowledgement, and I thank you for, uh, for catching me on that one. James Gassick says, Uhura and Hemmer probably deserves mention. I know you weren't going to touch on every relationship, but in one season, they really make us care about Hemmer, their relationship, and Uhura's grief feels earned and real. I might be biased. I love Strange New Worlds, LOL. Well, that is a bias I will not fault you for, because I love Strange New Worlds, too. And yes, Uhura and Hemmer is another really good one uh, that, that could have borne mentioning. And not only is Uhura and Hemmer a good relationship, and similar to the one I was just talking about a second ago with Seven and uh, the Doctor, because it is very much a, a mentor-student relationship. Hemmer is the, the more experienced officer, and Uhura is in the, se in the first season of Strange New Worlds when they have their relationship. Um, she's the cadet who's under his tutelage, and, you know, so there's, there's that dynamic between them. And, but yeah, she really, you do believe that they care about each other. You do believe that Uhura and Hemmer become close and become good friends, and there's a, a real affection and a real caring between them. And you know what? And here's the other thing. Most of that is accomplished in one episode. Like, the Uhura-Hemmer dynamic isn't contained in just one episode, but the, the, the closeness between them, um, the thing that exists between them that makes us sad when Hemmer dies and makes us believe that Uhura really misses him after he's gone, that is picked up on in season two in a really nice way, I thought. Um, that's accomplished almost entirely in one episode. That's the power of a well-written, episodic show like Strange New Worlds that tells its stories in self-contained segments, but also allows the characterization to carry through so that it doesn't feel like the events of one episode have no effect on the events of the future episodes. The Uhura and Hemmer relationship is, is established and solidified mostly in one episode, but it carries forward so that it means something beyond that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Strange New Worlds is such a well-written show. And it reminds me of Deep Space Nine, because at the end of the uh, BFFs video, I talk about the Cisco and Dax relationship and how watching them and realizing as I watched them that I believe that they really are friends. I believe that they really care about each other. And then by extension, I believe that the other characters on this show really have the relationships they are depicted as having, and it really means something to them. And when I watch the show, it feels like they're real people with real emotions. I feel that way about Strange New Worlds as well. And Strange New Worlds had me there by the end of its 10-episode first season. Shin Gallon. Oh, look at that. Breach Hull All Die. Even had it underlined. Oh, trust me, Mike. I calculated the odds that this would work versus the odds that I was doing something incredibly stupid, and, well, I went ahead anyway. <laughs> if you guys don't mind, if the rest of you are, are okay with it, um, Shin Gallon and I are just going to spend the rest of the video trading quotes from the Mystery Science Theater movie back and forth. Okay? Here's one from Ray Perry. Aliens convict you of a crime and sentence you to 20 brutal years! And you do those years only to wake up, get kicked in the butt, and told those years were a simulation in a computer, daddy! That's hard time! Oh, I'm finding my people! In this one, the, the Mystery Science Theater guy, and now someone throwing out a Dusty Rhodes promo to tie in with Hard Time. Ah, oh, I love it. And hey, check it out. Check it out. American Nightmare. Son of a son of a plumber. Keep the dream alive. Actually, and you know, the uh, I, I just so happen to be recording this video on the day of the Royal Rumble. So by the time you all watch this, you'll know whether Cody won or not. So I'm still here in the past. Not sure what's going to happen. Fingers crossed. Come on, Cody. And come on, people who book it, who decide who wins. Come on, Cody. There's a lot of crossover between Star Trek and uh, classic Dusty Rhodes promos to the extent that you might not expect if you, uh, you know, uh, don't have an, uh, an awareness and a familiarity with, with both going in. Because, you know, there's also that famous moment in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, when Khan is on uh, the wreckage of, uh, of the Reliant, and they're in the nebula, and he looks at the view screen, and he sees the Enterprise, uh, you know, trying to make its escape. And, and Khan has that, that famous line where he says, 
speaking as though he's speaking to Captain Kirk. It will never be over! Kaylee Lehrman, really? You're picking Prince of Thieves as the best Robin Hood movie? You know Men in Tights is right there, right? Yeah, and it's the shits. That's why I picked Prince of Thieves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I I have discovered over the past couple years, as I have made a few passing references to Robin Hood, and specifically Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, that there is a surprisingly large number of you who are, like, serious stands for Robin Hood men in tights, and I just don't get it. I mean, I don't get why you like that movie, because I have recently, just in the past couple years, I rewatched that movie after having seen it as a teenager when it first came out and didn't like it then. And I rewatched it relatively recently as an adult. And I was like, nope, I was right as a teenager. I watched the entire thing. I don't laugh once. There is not a single laugh in the entire movie for me. But even though I don't get why people like that movie, because I think it's terrible. It's one of Mel Brooks's worst movies. Uh, it does give me a deeper understanding of those of you who like that movie, who are also members of the of the Star Trek fan community, because if there are so many of you that love a movie like Robin Hood Men in Tights, a, a, a brutally, excruciatingly unfunny comedy, that completely explains to me why so many of you also love Lower Decks. And last one from the BFF's video from Breambo. My dream in life is to have Steve cuss me out. Oh, fuck off, you piece of shit! Is that what you needed? Did that do it for you? Now, these next several comments are from my video about what makes Star Trek Star Trek. This first one is from On the Nerdy Side, who says, The techno babble in Star Trek helps disguise the fact that it is pulp sci-fi. Add to that the reference books beginning with Mr. Scott's Guide to the Enterprise, to the various technical manuals and blueprints published for the ships, and you've got yourself the perfect recipe for fans taking the show as harder sci-fi than it actually is. That is a good point. There is a lot of made-up science in Star Trek, and I suppose that could and, and is taken as uh, real science by a lot of fans, and therefore Star Trek as a whole is treated as a harder sci-fi than it actually is. I mean, how can you say it's hard sci-fi when most of the science in it is stuff that was made up for this show? <laughs> um, but you, I guess you can get that impression. It's kind of like people who saw Donnie Darko and thought that that was a real book, like the book about time travel that is quoted from throughout the movie. Like a bunch of people thought that was a real book and tried to go read that book after they saw that movie. Um, so yeah, similar phenomenon. And also the the waters are muddied somewhat further by the fact that because Star Trek has been around for so long and because it has had such an influence on so many of, of us who have watched it, especially Star Trek fans who went on to enter like scientific fields and such, a lot of scientific concepts that were developed after Star Trek premiered and became popular have been named after things in Star Trek. So it makes Star Trek feel more scientific than it actually is. Like like the warp drive, the Alcubierre drive, is a theoretical concept for a faster-than-light propulsion system. And Al Alcubierre, the, the physicist who came up with it, has nicknamed it the warp drive. But he didn't develop that until the 1990s, when warp drive was already a thing in Star Trek since the 60s. So when, when Star Trek started saying warp drive and subspace and all that stuff, um, that was just stuff that the writers made up for the, for the purposes of the show. That was just conceits for the show, so that, oh, how does it fly that fast? How does the ship go from planet to planet so fast when the speed of light is this? Well, it goes faster than the speed of light because it has a warp drive and blah, blah, blah. And they communicate through subspace. And that's, you know, it's just dramatic convenience. But then real scientists developed real concepts and said, I'm going to call this a warp drive. So if you don't know that and you come to Star Trek after that, you might think, oh, the warp drive, huh? I guess they they incorporated that into Star Trek from the science. No, it was the other way around. It was the other way around. Um, and then after the the scientific warp drive concept became somewhat known, the writers of Star Trek then kind of changed the way they referred to the warp drive. And now in more recent um, Star Trek productions, the warp drive, when, when the warp drive is described in some way by a character in the show, it is referred to in ways that are closer to the theory that is attached to the Alcubierre drive. You know, whereas before that, it was just, oh, I don't know, whatever. You know, uh, so yeah, there's... 
there, there's kind of a there's more of a conversation between you know real scientists who are Star Trek fans and Star Trek and the people who create Star Trek that also makes it somewhat confusing for for people who don't know what the deal is as to how much actual science is is in Star Trek. Here's one from Dr. Moneypenny. Interesting video. If there's one other essence found in Star Trek, I'd say it's a joy for learning. For me, Star Trek is one of the few shows that shows its characters excited to learn in a positive way. How often do you hear Picard fascinated about an archaeological dig, or Archer wanting to investigate phenomena himself? The default in this universe is that knowledge is powerful and exciting. In my mind, this quality is why characters are open-minded and curious about diversity. That is a great point, and related to that point is also that for the most part, as a rule throughout Star Trek, the heroes are people of intelligence. Like Star Trek as a franchise values intelligence, values education, values expertise. You know, the, the heroes of Star Trek are not everyman type characters. They are extraordinary and accomplished, and they are accomplished intellectually. Like they're really smart. Not and they're not all smart in the exact same way. But they're all really smart. Like even Captain Kirk, like the, the caricature of Captain Kirk is of like this skirt chasing guy. But if you watch classic Star Trek, he's portrayed as a really smart guy. And part of his backstory is that he was just this impossibly dedicated, studious cadet when he was at Starfleet Academy. I think there's a line in, in the second pilot where uh, Gary Mitchell calls him a stack of books with legs, or that was, that was what he was known as back in the Academy. He was a stack of books with legs because he was so dedicated to his studies. And so, I mean, from the very beginning, intelligence and expertise, being good at your job and knowing what to do and how to do it, like that's been a, a big part of, the, of all of the, the major protagonists of... Uh, of Star Trek, even Chief O'Brien, who is the closest to an everyman type hero in of all of the major characters, he is still incredibly smart and incredibly skilled at his job. He's the guy who can fix anything. Like he has a level of technical and and mathematical expertise that is way beyond what most of us watching the show will ever have. So that's another thing about Star Trek that is tied in with the um the the joy of learning and and the the yearning to to discover and to understand. It's also a, a very high premium placed on intelligence and expertise. And I know that is something that a lot of fans really feel drawn to and appreciate in it as well, including me. This next comment is from Malzara Erwin. Having only recently started watching Discovery, I can sort of see where people are coming from with this, but ultimately it still feels like Star Trek, even if a different flavor of it. The moment that really sold me on it having the general spirit of it was when the tardigrade turned out to not just be a rampaging monster, but a creature that had been in pain. And that arc ending with one of the crew taking the burden of hooking up to the network on himself rather than risk killing it and eventually setting the creature free. Discovery isn't perfect, it has flaws, it makes mistakes, but it does still ultimately feel like Star Trek to me. I agree with you, and that storyline from season one is also the one that I would point to if somebody tried to argue with me that Discovery was not true to the spirit of Star Trek or not true to the principles of Star Trek. I do see, to an extent, I see the point of the arguments that the first season of Discovery was too dark or was too grim or took too long to get to the hopeful stuff, because it does stick the landing at the end where it does it does acknowledge at the end like starfleet is supposed to be about hope starfleet is supposed to be about discovery no pun intended and and seeking out new life and and expanding our knowledge of the universe and meeting new people like that's what we're supposed to be here to do not all this stuff about war and death and and violence but it takes so long to get there that if that is what you are coming to star trek for i can kind of understand if you would if you didn't make it that far, you know, if you gave up on the show because you felt it was too grim. But underneath that that layer of of grimness and that layer of of uh for Star Trek uncharacteristic darkness, there is always that thread of, you know, these are the people we should be. And it and it has that interest in the kind of moral and ethical dilemmas that Star Trek has had from the beginning. And the Tardigrade storyline is the best example of that. 
from season one. And I, I say this a lot about the new shows when they impress me, but that's classic Star Trek. That dilemma of we have this device that is very important that can help us end this terrible war, but in order for this device to operate properly, we need to make this creature suffer. And what is the right decision there? Do we do we make the creature suffer so that this thing, this new technology we have works properly and we can use it to, you know, to its fullest potential and maybe win the war and save millions or billions of lives? Or do we allow this creature to go free and not make it suffer and, you know, and potentially lose the war? And in true Star Trek fashion, they find the third option, which is Stamets decides to uh, alter his own genetics so that the spore drive will operate with him plugged in instead of the tardigrade, and they set the tardigrade free. It's classic Star Trek. It's classic Star Trek. Brian Baker, Star Trek, and I are almost the same age, and it's grown up just like I have. The attitudes of American society is reflected in the progress and improvement of Star Trek, and I, for one, am glad to have my assumptions challenged by the philosophy of Star Trek. I'm appreciative of my growth as a person that was caused by the questions raised by the series that would not die. Absolutely. And that's something that I always value in, in any work of art, whether it's a TV show or a movie or music or literature or whatever it is. I like being challenged. I like being made to think. That's one of the things I love about The Twilight Zone, one of my other favorite shows. It makes you think and it forces you to question yourself and to question your own values and your own priorities and your own biases. And Star Trek at its best does that as well. I think one of the things that has made people, that has made some longtime Star Trek fans uncomfortable with the, the more recent stuff is the more recent stuff, particularly Discovery and Strange New Worlds, is more comfortable, and, and Deep Space Nine did this as well, but um, enough time has gone by that I think maybe some people have forgotten that Deep Space Nine used to do this a lot, but they've, they're have they more comfortable forcing us to question ourselves. In classic Star Trek, in TNG, the social commentary very often was 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 uh, directed outward. The, the problematic group in the episode was someone else. There were those people over there, this planet that we just visited, they're doing this thing that they shouldn't be doing, you know? And it allowed us, because we identify with Starfleet, we identify with the Federation, and the problem was with people outside the Federation, so we could kind of let ourselves off the hook and say, well, that's not our problem, that's their problem over there, and isn't it terrible that those people are so racist or so homophobic or, or, or so authoritarian or so repressive or whatever? But with Strange New Worlds and Discovery and Deep Space Nine, they were more likely to to direct the, the gaze inward and say, no, 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 this is a problem with our society right now, and we need to fix it. And if this is how you think, or you believe that this kind of thing is okay, then you need to reevaluate that. We need to change, not those people over there, us. And that is a challenge. You know, that is a challenging message. And a lot of people don't like that, you know, especially if you come to Star Trek and because Star Trek has been around for so long and a lot of us watched it as kids and maybe watched it with our parents or our grandparents or our brothers or our sisters and we've grown up with it and we view it, especially the older shows, uh, we, we view it with a certain nostalgia and we have warm feelings about it and it's, it's our comfort food. And we don't like being, cha comfort food is supposed to go down easy. It's supposed to make us happy. It's supposed to make us feel all warm and fuzzy. And when we watch Star Trek and feel that it is challenging us, that's, that can be off-putting to some people because they've grown accustomed to Star Trek being this comfortable, reassuring thing. And it never was that. Not really. I mean, okay, it, it was that from time to time, but the purpose of Star Trek from the beginning, like Gene Roddenberry didn't, didn't create Star Trek with the idea of, let me just do a nice, easy show that'll make people happy and comfortable and won't ask any questions and won't challenge any assumptions. Like that was, that was never the concept from the very beginning. So when Star Trek nowadays is challenging and is provocative and f is trying to get you to question things about your society and yourself and your values... That's just the modern version of doing what Star Trek has always done. It's just now it's doing it in 
a little bit more of a direct and inward looking way, which I think is fantastic. And now this next group of comments is from my video about Star Trek Generations. This one is from All Pink 92. I always wanted Kirk to meet Worf, to know that the events of the previous movie had been worth it, to see that there is a Klingon working for Starfleet on the Enterprise. I think it was a huge missed opportunity. Maybe have uh, Kirk see Worf for the first time and do that thing that they do the same thing they did with Scotty in Relics. Right when Scotty looks at Worf and he's kind of he, he's a little unsettled. He's not sure what to do about Worf. Have that moment of tension between Kirk and Worf, and have Captain Picard or somebody say, oh, "Captain Kirk, I'd like you to meet Lieutenant Worf, our chief of security." And have that moment of silent tension between them, and then Kirk extends his hand and says, "Lieutenant, it's a pleasure to meet you," or something like that. You know, to indicate that Kirk has grown beyond his prejudice for Klingons. And yes, as you say in the question, Kirk sees that what occurred at uh, um, Kittimer and what occurred between, you know, the, the conspirators and the crew of the Enterprise in Star Trek VI and the, the, the defeat of the conspiracy and the plowing ahead with the peace process and all that stuff in Star Trek VI, that yes, it was worth it. It did create a better future you know, for, for, for Starfleet and for the Klingons. Yeah, that would be a nice moment. And it would, I think it would work well within the movie and it would also touch back to the previous movie in a way that would be nice for people who had seen the previous movie. So yes, I think that would have been a very lovely moment. Accidentally Derivative says, I always thought a very simple change they could have made to Generations that would have made it sit better with me was somehow getting Kirk on the battle bridge of the Star Drive section during the imminent breach and having him take out the Bird of Prey. Kirk on the bridge of the Enterprise, going out fighting Klingons, that I'll buy. I feel like introducing the battle bridge might be tough. But having Kirk on the main bridge, coming up with some contrivance to have Kirk on the main bridge of the Enterprise D, um, might work, depending on how you write it. If we're going with the version that only that Kirk is the only one who crosses over, uh, that we're that uh, you know, it's basically generations as as it exists, but we get Kirk on the Enterprise somehow instead of just leaving him on the planet once he comes through the Nexus. Like, um, it, yeah, that there might be something to having Kirk on the bridge of the Enterprise and fighting the Klingons uh, and that leading to Kirk's death and the, the rescue of the rest of the crew or something like that. But the battle bridge feels a little complicated to throw into the movie at that late stage, unless you have found a way to introduce it earlier than that. Maybe if you could write, if you could find a way to motivate having a scene set on the battle bridge earlier in the movie, you know, like maybe instead, I mean, it, and it's, uh, it's awfully ham-fisted and it feels like really heavy foreshadowing, but if instead of like the scene on the holodeck with all of them on, on the, on the ship, you know, at the beginning, have, have some kind of like a battle drill or something be the introduction to the TNG crew and have some of them on the battle bridge I don't know if it's, I would want if if we're going to have Kirk on the battle bridge at the end of the movie I would need to introduce the battle bridge in the movie before that at some point. And if I could figure out a way to do that I'd be all for that. Um but if I couldn't I wouldn't want to just drop that in at the end. I feel like that's that's a little too much. Here's one from Benji Schuyler, most unforgivable retcon, Picard throwing aside the gift from his archaeology professor because he's more concerned with finding the family album. The meaning of that is the family album is the most important thing to him. The movie, Picard's story in the movie wasn't about him being an archaeologist and that priceless artifact that his old archaeology professor gave him in a season of the TV, in the, what, last, the previous year of the TV show or something like that. Um, that's that, that's not what the movie was about. The heart of Picard's story in the movie was about his family and the loss of his family and the grief he feels at the loss of his family. So in that context, within that story, of course, the family album is going to mean more to him than this thing that he was given as a gift by his old archaeology professor. Now, and this is a mistake a lot of people make, and this is one of the reasons why I dislike the way of writing these shows more recently, where the characters are written as though they are people who watch the show as opposed to people who live in that world. Of course, the archaeology thing means more to a hardcore Star Trek fan because you remember that from a previous episode and you remember what it meant in that episode. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and we've never seen Picard's family album 
until this movie. So it's a thing from a previous episode that's been previously established as very important versus a thing that we just saw for a scene in this movie for the first time ever. So to us as a viewer, the thing that was previously established, the archaeological artifact, is going to seem more important. But it doesn't matter what we think is more important. We're not characters in the, in the movie. Picard is a character in the movie. Within the fiction, he is living his actual life. And in his actual life, he has just lost the only family that he had left, and he wants that family album. And that means more to him than this thing that his archaeology professor gave him. As, as priceless as it is and as happy as he was to get it, it means nothing to him compared to the memories of his family. So it is absolutely the right thing to do in that scene. And I really don't get what people's problems are with it. This next comment is from Keith Thorpe. One thing about Picard and Guinan's first conversation about the Nexus that I always felt was so heavy-handed with its foreshadowing was Guinan saying to Picard, if you go there, you won't care about us, this ship, or anything else. All you'll want is to stay in the Nexus. That was the flavor of the line anyway. All I could think was, why would she mention that? What possible course of action was Picard embarking on or even considering that would take him into the Nexus? Like I said, it was just all so on the nose. That is a really good catch. I never thought of that, but you are absolutely right. You're giving me flashbacks to a few years ago when someone left a comment on another video of mine and pointed out to me in Star Trek Three, for most of the movie, Kirk doesn't know that bringing Spock back to life is even an option. Like, we, watching the movie, have seen uh, David and Savick and Spock, the, the, the resurrected Spock, growing from a child back to manhood on the Genesis planet. Like, we've seen all of that going on. So we know that Spock coming back to life and being reunited with his consciousness that has been contained in Dr. McCoy's brain. Like, we can see that coming, right? We know that that's where the movie's going. But Kirk doesn't know that. All Kirk knows is that McCoy is carrying Spock's consciousness and that according to uh, Spock's dad, it's really important that Spock's body be returned to Vulcan and that his immortal spirit be returned to Vulcan so that he can have peace. He says, you know, as long as, as, long as McCoy is carrying Spock's Katra, neither one of them will know peace. So the, the, the mission, as far as Kirk is concerned, is just to, to help his friends and to, and to honor the memory of his dead best friend Spock and to give him the, the burial or, or the, you know, whatever is appropriate for his culture that he didn't give him the first time. It's not about bringing Spock back to life until close to the end when he realizes that Spock's body has been brought back to life. And this scene in Generations, it's not quite as meaningful as that, but it's the same idea. It's like, it's like fridge logic. It's like something that you, you, you don't even think about until it just comes to you at four o'clock in the morning when you're standing, staring at the refrigerator, you know, trying to decide if you want to um, make yourself a snack or something because you can't sleep. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Why did Guinan say that to him about the Nexus? That doesn't make any sense. He wasn't planning on going into the Nexus. There was no reason for her to say that. You're absolutely right. It sets expectations for us in the audience, but there's no reason for those two characters to have that conversation. So, yeah, and they, they slipped it in on you. The screenwriters, they snuck it in, and it worked on me because I never realized it. They snuck it on me all these years, and you caught it, so good for you. Now, these next comments are from my video about the trolley problem in Star Trek. And this first one is from Pig Meat Markham, who says... One point overlooked in the Spock scenario is that he was going to die anyway. His choice meant that only he would die. That is a good point. It does change the scenario a little bit with reference to the trolley problem, because the classic trolley problem is that you, the person being asked whether or not to pull the lever, are a bystander. And Spock was not a bystander. Spock was one of the people tied to the tracks, and he came up with a way to alter the situation so that the trolley would only hit him and everybody else would be spared. So that is that is slightly different than the classic trolley problem. And it makes Spock's sacrifice, um, I mean, it still makes it a very noble sacrifice because he, he basically made the logical decision of, okay, I see a way that I can uh, involve myself in this problem and I, 
if I don't involve myself, we will all die, including me. But if I do involve myself, I will still die, but everybody else will live. So he makes the, the selfless decision uh, to save everyone at the cost of his life rather than to lose his life along with everyone else. So it makes his, his sacrifice um, more meaningful and also more logical. Like it, it, when you look at it that way, it's a very logical decision. You know, and and he, I mean, he he says to Kirk at the end as he's dying, "Don't grieve, Admiral. It was logical." Here's one from Christoph B. You forgot another infamous example of the trolley problem: Tuvix. On the surface, Janeway seemingly decides to kill one person to save two, but as an additional factor, she's convinced that both Tuvok and Neelix are crucial to her crew getting home, aka surviving. For her, the trade-off was not killing one person to save two but sacrificing one person to save her entire crew, roughly 140 people, that she, as captain, is ultimately responsible for. We can debate if she was right in her conviction and her action, but I think that's beside the point. The point of the episode is showing a person being confronted by this dilemma and exploring the process of how they come to a decision, specifically from a person in a leadership role. I think that's fair, but looking at the episode from that perspective does make me wish that Janeway had been more of the central character in that episode rather than Tuvix. Like, if if the ultimate decision in the story is to be made by Janeway, not by Tuvix, then the story of the episode should be about Janeway. And it should be a story involving Tuvix. Like, I don't think they should... I mean, the, the presence of Tuvix... And the loss or seeming loss of Tuvok and Neelix and all of that should still be the events of the episode. But if the most important decision at the end of the episode is made by Janeway, then Janeway should be the lead character of that story. And I think Tuvix is the lead character of that story. And Janeway is in more of a supporting role in that particular episode. And if if the point of the episode is, well, Janeway as the leader had to make this difficult decision and she had to do what she thought was right for the entire crew, not just for Tuvix, um, then the story should have been about Janeway and Tuvix should have been more of a supporting character. Here's one from Sonia Vadin. It's moving down an empty track but you can divert its course by pulling the lever onto a track which the entire production team of PragerU are tied to. Ah uh, yes, the scenario also known as the trolley solution. This one is from Aaron Loon. I think one aspect of Star Trek's answer to the trolley problem has been overlooked, and I think it's about as famous as it gets. The Kobayashi Maru. The correct answer to the trolley problem is to disregard the dichotomy of choosing between the number of dead and just invent a solution that saves everyone. I think you might want to watch that movie again. Kirk's reprogramming of the Kobayashi Maru as a cadet to make it possible to beat the test and save everyone is presented as, as a character flaw of Kirk. It's, it's an example of his hubris. It allows him to delude himself into believing that there is no such thing as a no-win scenario. And it's compounded by that moment uh, in in the Genesis cave, when they're about to beam back up to the Enterprise, and you know Kirk takes that bite of the apple, and he stands up and goes, and very confidently he declares, "I don't believe in the no win scenario," and it's like this classic like action adventure hero moment. And then at the end of the movie, of course, he gets smacked in the face with the cold hard reality that he is in a real life no win scenario, and there is no way out of it. That's what leads to the death of Spock. That is a no-win scenario. It isn't possible to save everyone. Spock has to die for everyone else to be saved. There is no way to save everyone. So, uh, yeah, I really don't think the message of the Kobayashi Maru in that movie is sometimes you just have to forge your own path and not accept the, the, the two answers you're given and go the third way. I mean, I, I agree with you. There is a lot of that in Star Trek and in action adventure fiction and, and just fiction in general. The hero being presented with two options and then saying, I'm not going to do either one of these. I'm going to do something else. And that being the path to victory, like that is a very common storytelling thing, right? But in Star Trek II, that's not the message. The message is, no, there is such a thing as a no-win scenario. And if you delude yourself into thinking that you can always escape and you can always think your way out of it. You can always cheat death. Eventually you're going to find out 
that you can't. And that's what Kirk is forced to confront in that movie. And this final batch of questions is from my video about Star Trek for the Voyage Home. And this first one is from Arkel Studios, who says, I'm probably not the first or even the smartest, definitely not the best looking person to say this, but I think it's fair to say that a fourth Kelvinverse film might have happened by now if not for what happened to Anton Yelchin. I really don't think that had anything to do with it, to be honest. Uh, not not to downplay the, the tragedy of what happened to Anton Yelchin and what a, what a loss he was, not just to Star Trek, but as, a, as an actor in general. He was a, a fantastic actor. And, um, of course, his loss would diminish, you know, any future Kelvinverse film, and I think his absence would be felt. Um, but no, I don't think that had any, anything to do with how long it's taken to get another movie. I think the reason why it's taken so long to get a fourth Kelvinverse movie going is because uh, Star Trek Beyond underperformed at the box office and the studio wasn't sure it wanted to pay the actors what they were asking for and what they deserve in order to make another movie. And they just weren't sure if making a fourth movie in that series would be worth it financially to them. And then there was COVID that shut a lot of stuff down. And then there were the, you know, just this past year, there were the the, the writers and the actor strikes that ground production on everything to a halt. And, and, and so there have been sort of external factors plus um, production delays in other ways and having having different writers come on and then leave and different directors come on and then leave. It's just been a very fraught development process um, exacerbated by the fact that I don't think the studio has ever been 100% sure it even wants to do the movie after Star Trek Beyond did not meet expectations, even though I thought Star Trek Beyond was the best one, but commercially it didn't meet expectations. And I think that's that has way more to do with it than than the unfortunate death of Anton Yelchin. Um, you're, you're forgetting that Hollywood is run by vampires. And the people in charge of green lighting movies don't give a shit whether Anton Yelchin died or not. Now, the people who worked with him, the real human beings, the artists and the crafts people who, who actually day to day make the movie. Oh, sure. I'm sure they were devastated and it probably meant a lot to them. But to the executives who are in charge of whether or not another movie is going to be made, they didn't give a shit. They, all they care about is money. They didn't give a shit that Anton Yelchin, they, most of them probably don't even know who Anton Yelchin is. And if you said to them, he was the guy who played Chekhov in the, th the last three Star Trek movies, they'd say, Chekhov, who was that? They haven't even seen the movies. They don't care. They don't. I, I, I cannot stress enough to you how much the people in charge of making the movies that you love do not care about you or any of the people involved in making those movies. Dataport doll. What I love about the bounty is that it's so perfectly tailor-made for the plot of Voyage Home. The Enterprise could never land like a shuttle, couldn't cloak to hide from contemporary tech, and it's disposable and doesn't have to survive the end of the film for your dramatic crash scene. It baffles my writer's brain that the team made such a perfect fitting story with the elements that existed at the end of the search for Spock. I agree completely with everything you just said. I also admire the way the story is structured and the way it is built logically and organically from the end of Star Trek III. And to me, it's an example of why it's perfectly fine to make things up as you go along. If you know what you're doing, if you are a good enough storyteller, one of the big criticisms of the sequel trilogy of Star Wars, right, was... And a lot of people say this. So many people have said this that it has almost become conventional wisdom. They say, well, the problem was they didn't plan it out from the start. They didn't plan out all three movies from the beginning before they started shooting the movie. I mean, they didn't do that with Star Wars and Empire and Return of the Jedi either. I know that's become kind of like a myth. Like, and I, I think sometimes George Lucas would like people to believe that they like they, that. Oh, he had all three movies all plotted out beforehand, and they were just following George's directions when they made Star Wars and Empire and Jedi. No, no, that's not how it happened. That's not how it happened. I mean, George had a general idea of a very broad arc of you know what these stories would be, but in terms of what the actual plots and even major story developments in those subsequent films, that those were invented as those films were written. Star Wars and Empire and Jedi were to a very large degree 
made up as they went along. So the flaw isn't lack of pre-planning and then rigidly sticking to that pre-planning. The flaw is bad writing, except for The Last Jedi, which I maintain is a fantastic movie. Um, but the problem with a bad series of movies isn't that they didn't plan it out all from the beginning. It's bad writing. And Star Trek Three and Star Trek Four is an example of good writing. They said, okay, we're going to make a sequel to Star Trek Three. So what are we going to do? We're going to, are, are we going to start right? Is Star Trek Four going to start right where Star Trek Three left off? Okay, well, if we do that, what do we have to work with? Where are our characters? How are they going to get from where they are to where they need to be? What's the ship? We blew up the Enterprise last time. So what's the ship? Are they going to still be on the Klingon ship? Okay, they're on the Klingon ship. What have we established that a Klingon ship can do that would be of use to us in our story? And they they built the story around things like that. And yeah, it's and it's good writing. It's good practical um, story storytelling and story structure. It's 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 fantastic. And I agree with you. It's it's in that way. It's one of the cleverest plot structures and one of the cleverest. Uh, um, beginning premises, I guess, of a Star Trek movie that that we've seen so far. And it's an example of being good at making it up as you go along. You say, okay, this was what happened in the last one. What's going to happen in this one? And what can I take from the last one and carry forward and make use of that will aid and guide and influence the story I'm about to tell? That's good writing. It's not a result of pre-planning. It's a result of being a smart, intelligent, clever writer. Wireless Mike, The Voyage Home was, and in many ways still is, my favorite Star Trek movie. Leonard Nimoy did an amazing job of bringing out the character of the characters in a way no other director ever had. I miss him being around. And I'm with you. I want a fourth movie in the rebooted universe. The whole cast is amazing, and Chris Pine is a great Kirk, and the soundtrack for the first movie is one of my favorite soundtracks of any movie ever. In fact, I'm going to watch it again right now. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm right there with you, man. One of my favorite movie scores of all time. I love that score so much. Um, I think I've said in videos before, the, the, the music to the end of the prologue, when, uh, when Kirk's father... Uh, dies on the Kelvin as they're escaping, and there's that that silent, well, not silent, but it's it's a mon the montage that is, the, uh, and it's it's just the score. You know, there's no dialogue. There's the sound effects are 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 mixed underneath the music, and you just get that that beautiful Michael Giacchino score. It's the adagio for strings of Star Trek. It is just wrenching. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Fantastic. One of the best, one of the best Star Trek scores, one of the best movie scores of the last probably 30 or 40 years. I love it. Adam Busenlehner. Leonard Rosenman's complete score is available on CD from the Entrada soundtrack label. I found the score disappointing as the main theme was lifted from Rosenman's score for the animated Lord of the Rings film. It did not deserve the Academy Award nomination, in my opinion. It's fair enough if you feel that way, but I personally don't give a shit. Like, it wasn't Leonard Rosenman ripping off another composer. It was Leonard Rosenman ripping off himself. He was borrowing from music that he wrote for a previous project and then reincorporating it or, or you know, reinterpreting it for uh, Star Trek IV. And look, I was not on the committee of the Academy that decided whether or not it was eligible for uh, the, you know, the category it was nominated in. I can't speak to whether or not it really quote unquote deserved its nomination or not in accordance with the rules that were in place at the time. All I know is I listened to that score, I watched that movie, and I think that's a beautiful score and I think that's a beautiful main theme. It's not my job to grade his fucking homework. You know, it's my job to articulate how the music makes me feel. And I think on that basis, it's a fantastic score. And I do think it's interesting how some people treat that as like a, such a big deal, because you're not the first person to say that. You're not the first person to say, well, he, you know, he reused some of his theme from the Lord of the Rings cartoon. And so therefore, blah, 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 blah. Bruce Springsteen has reused lyrics in multiple songs. There are, there are multiple Bruce Springsteen songs where he has, he has taken lyrics from an earlier song and dropped them into a later song. I mean, still his lyrics, right? In blues music, it was, it was common practice for decades for blues musicians to reuse music or to re, to repurpose music into different songs or to use different 
lyrical lines, you know, in different songs and, and to borrow from their past work. And in, in many cases, to borrow from each other for blues musicians to use each other's lyrics or each other's music with an understanding that that was an acceptable practice. So it just, it really doesn't upset me. And finally, our last comment from Mr. Baca. I was today years old when I realized that the home to which they are voyaging is the Enterprise, not Earth. Yes, I've watched this movie many times. Now listen, don't feel too bad, because yes, home does refer to the, the new Enterprise that they get at the end, and Kirk does say, my friends, we've come home, but home refers to all kinds of stuff in that movie. So your interpretation that home referred to Earth is not wrong. It's, there, there are many different senses in which home applies. You know, it's the voyage home in that at the beginning of the movie, they leave Vulcan and they are heading back to Earth in the 23rd century. They are going home to face the consequences of their actions in the previous film. So the voyage home refers to that. But then that voyage gets interrupted because they, they are almost to Earth and they find out about the probe. So then they travel back in time and they make it home to Earth, but it's not the Earth they know. It's the Earth of the past. And then the voyage home becomes getting the whales and returning to their own time. So it's a voyage not just through space, but through time. And then they make it back to their, their Earth and their time, and they have accomplished their mission and saved the Earth. And then they realize that the voyage isn't yet over because they still have the voyage to return to the bridge of the Enterprise, or, or to be restored to the Enterprise, the new Enterprise that is taking the place of, of the previous one. So, home means a lot of different things. So it's not that you got it wrong. It's that you interpreted it in a way, and then you realized that there was another interpretation of it that you had never uh, noticed before. And that's a wonderful thing. So it doesn't mean that you know, you, you weren't paying attention or you did something wrong. It's it's one of the nice things about that movie and about the title of that movie is that the title is, the title is more clever than you think it is because it doesn't just refer to one thing. It can be taken in a lot of different ways. So there you go. Oh, that's it. That's all that I'm going to do for this video. Thank you all so much for watching these videos I do. Thank you so much for the, the comments, the great comments that you leave, the questions you ask, the things you point out that I missed that give me a chance to talk about in subsequent videos like this. Um, it's I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for you and your attention and your interest in this and the interaction that we can have in these videos and in the comment sections when, when I respond to your comments in that way. This is just awesome, and I could not do this without all of you watching and, you know, doing the liking and sharing and all that stuff, and, and, and participating, and making not just these comment response videos, but all these videos I do possible, and a lot of fun to do. So, if you enjoy this work that I do, if you enjoy this YouTube channel and these videos I make, and you are in a position financially where you are able to support the work that I do, please consider doing that by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shives, or becoming a channel member by clicking the join button on the YouTube page, or just making a one-time gift via the thanks button on the YouTube page, or via PayPal or Venmo. Any financial support you can throw my way is greatly appreciated and it adds up and it helps me to continue to do this and also to keep my bills paid and all that nice stuff. So thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for helping me out, for supporting the channel and for making these videos always a joy to do. And I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.